how to do that in a in a not acky way uh, as a spiritual coach. And so this is going to be the other side of the conversation from last week. And for those of you who are wondering, I know I didn't address it. I apologize. We had an episode that just didn't go out. Uh, and that was because the episode uh, that didn't go out was so gummed up that our editing guy just threw up his hands and said, nope, can't do it. Because I got kicked out of the the show like six times and I kept coming back in and I would start talking, but they couldn't hear me and they kept talking and it was just, it was a cluster. <laughs> so he finally just said, nope. And my assistant didn't see it until like seven o'clock when it was supposed to be being posted because she had COVID. And so we just didn't have an episode go out. So we, we dropped in an episode from the Ethereal Podcast Network, which I'm part of. And so I apologize for missing that episode and then not mentioning anything about it for a while because, you know, we pre-record. So that's why you didn't get an episode that time. And uh, we will be revisiting the episode with that person uh, who is Maria Rothenberger, who talks about spirit babies. And that was a really great conversation. And I'm so sad that we didn't get to put it out. But she is going to come back and, and podcast again. But clearly, it is not time yet for that to happen. Because she was scheduled to do that today with me just before we edited just before we recorded this episode. And in actuality, I had no power. The power was out here in Panama for like four hours. And it was all over the county. I wasn't sure we were going to get this episode done, to be honest. Honest. So I had to reschedule her yet again. So not yet, but she will be here. And it's a really good conversation. And I promise you should really check it out because it was so cool the first time. And I'm sure it'll be cool the second time. The little bit of it that I got to hear the first time. So, <laughs> you know. oh my God, you know, technology, it's just so much fun. And, and, you know, every time it's because spirit said, yeah, this is not the right timing for this. I got kicked out of a call today when I was on my, my, uh, uh, when I was on zoom, I was on a uh, networking call and I got kicked out and I couldn't get back in and I couldn't get back in. I couldn't get back in. And finally I came back in and they'd already split into groups. And so I didn't get the group, but I got to talk to the person who was running the call and she and I had the great connection. And I was like, ah, that was why I got kicked out is because I needed to come back in and just be talking to her. And so, you know, I'm going to schedule a call to talk to her and all the things, right? So we have to trust the universe and that the universe has our back and that, that it, everything is for us, not, uh, you know, to us, right? So with that said, um, that's an interesting way to transition into our topic for today. <laughs> Before we go into the topic, though, please remember to like, rate, and share. Uh, we are we love to hear what you have to say. Please write a review if you have the ability to do that. That's over on Apple Podcasts. I think that's really the only place that lets you write a review. Uh, but, you know, we, we love it. Thank you so much for doing it. And uh, so today's topic, again, is spiritual coach training. Uh, and we're talking about power dynamics. So, Kathy. Yes. You and I have known not, not a few people, you know, <laughs> more, yeah, than, a more few than a few people, yes. more, than a, more few. than a few people who, who uh, have some toxic traits as teachers. And so, you know, let's, let's start off with the toxic traits, because that I think is, is a relevant piece of the puzzle. Uh, and then we can drop into, I know you've got a, a head full of everything you want to talk about. So... Um, but I want to start off with the toxic traits because I think that that's, it's a good indicator for ourselves, right? So it, this is, I want you to use this as a diagnostic. If you're a spiritual coach or a teacher and you're listening to this episode, I want you to listen to these symptoms because these are the, the sort of toxic trait symptoms, right? That, that tell you that you've got work to do. So let me be really clear. We are not judging you in this scenario. Okay. We have all been in our egos and we have all screwed up as spiritual teachers in our time. I mean, screwed up bad, you know, this just, we do our best and we are human and we screw up and that's just the nature of the beast. So I want to be clear that, that this isn't a nye, 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 you suck episode. Okay. This is a, Hey, 
if this is something that happens to you, you need to recognize that this is something that indicates that you have some inner work to do before you continue to work with your clients. You need to sit down and really look at this stuff because this is the stuff that can cause damage to your clients. And that's the last thing any coach or teacher wants to do, right? So I'm gonna start with, if you feel threatened by one of your students, you have some work to do because the triggering of your feeling threatened is a power dynamic issue, right? Two, if you are upset or you get angry or defensive, if somebody asks you a question or questions something you told them, that's an indicator that you need to do some inner work because questions are ways that people understand things. They are not challenges to your authority unless you have set it up that way. And if you have set it up that way, that is an indicator that you need to do some work around it, right? Um, can you think of some more, Kathy? I'm just, well, you, these are off the top of my head. You an interesting word because, yeah. um, and that's authority. Yes. Okay, is because authority can uh, trip you up. And uh, one of the ones that I know you and I have talked about over the years is uh, what I refer to as the need to fix. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. is that uh, you Or can... heal. Right. Yeah. Same thing. Yes. But the, the one in particular I want to talk about in a little bit more detail right here is the one wherein if you can see something that somebody really needs. OK. And then you step into the place that says, I will tell you what you need. OK. Because I know and you clearly don't. Which is in, in one sense. Well, this is what they hired me for. Right. But if you, yeah, I see you, you're going to have to. Yeah, so for moment. those of you who are listening and not looking at the, the, the YouTube, I am hiding my face right now because Kathy called me on this one 20 years ago. <laughs> I did this incessantly 20 years ago. And, and she was the one who called me out on it. So I'm going to let her finish talking now, but that's why I'm hiding my face. <laughs> uh -huh. But it's important. This one's hugely important because. It is. You have, you may see it, okay? I mean, that's your role in part as a spiritual coach or a spiritual teacher. You can see it, but that doesn't mean they're ready to hear it yet, right? Okay? So there's a second step to, okay, I see it, and then there's a, are they ready to hear it? And so there's little methodologies for like sort of dancing around the edges and, you know, trying to see whether they're going to tweak to it or not, instead of going, boom, here, this is the thing, because if they are not ready to hear it, what you have just done is inoculated them against ever getting the truth. Because if they're not ready, they'll throw up a resistance. And the resistance means they're, they're now at a, at a worse point for ever getting the realization because now they've got a resistance against it. Right. So it will take them longer to get to the good realization because you've just inoculated them with a resistance to getting there. Yeah. So I'm going to bring up the, the next one, which is if you're having sex with your students, mm -hmm. you shouldn't be teaching. Yep. Okay. That one, that, that is, it's in the spiritual world. That is the equivalent of incest. That's how bad it is. Okay. Don't do it. It's, 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 it's yeah. Don't do it, okay? Um, I don't care how attracted to you they are. I don't care. It doesn't matter. You should not be having sex with your students. Okay, uh, next one. Um, you, got, you got an idea? Because I'm still chewing on them. <laughs> yeah, well, the, like the sex one is huge. That's yeah. absolutely huge. I've seen so many things blow up around that one. Oh my God, and it yeah. isn't just sex, it's inappropriate touch. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's all the things that go favoritism. Around. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, the pitting your students against each other in any way is yes. is, is a problem, right? Yes. So, so favoritism that happens when there's a, a sexual dynamic or even just, you know, you like somebody so much better than everybody else and you put them above everybody else and then everybody else gets jealous. And then there's all these dynamics that happen and it just, it's not helpful, right? Yeah. Yep. So you've got to avoid even the appearance of favoritism, right? And the, another one is the um, insidiousness of somebody else's power. 
Okay. Mm. When we are an authority figure, as a spiritual coach, as a leader of any type, okay, people who are not yet sovereign, who are looking for answers, who are who don't have a solid core yet, will project their power onto the leader, onto the teacher, onto the therapist, onto you know, projection is a thing, big time. Yes. Okay. And there are, I, I, we all know the examples, but spiritual teachers who have taken that projection, oh, oh, mighty, mighty, and they went, yes, I am mighty, mighty, right? And they have owned power that technically isn't theirs. Mm -hmm. And that can be abusive because it's to yourself as a spiritual teacher as well as to the student. There's a... It's hugely important to recognize that when somebody hands their power over to you in a leadership position, that you're stewarding the power. This is not yours. You are caring for it for them until they have grown and evolved to the point where they can take it back. Yeah. And then they get it back. You do not hang on to it. You do not fight them over it. You do not... and. If you can manage to do that, they don't fight you for it. Right. You know, in, in terms of the dynamic shifts, but it shifts in a much more um, easeful way when you're recognizing you're stewarding the power. And then they come back and go, I, I actually had a student once go, I want my power back. I went, okay. <laughs> they were like, what? You know, because they had, had had other teachers who didn't. Right. right. And I said, sure, you know. Um, and we went through a little exercise and, and because I wasn't hanging on to it, right. I was stewarding it. So they breathed it back in and, and took it into themselves. And it's kind of like, oh, no, well, now our relationship shifts. And I'm like, yes, now our relationship shifts. Yeah. And it was easeful. But right. um, it's not if you take that power. And it's particularly insidious if at core you've got some concerns for, can I really do this? Am I really this good? If you have an internal dynamic whereby you're questioning it, that becomes Velcro to when they're projecting power onto you. Because then that power that they're projecting on you basically Velcros to that, to that internal questioning of self and says, yes, I am, and yes, I can. And, yeah. it, and then it becomes that much harder to deal well, with going and forward. To go along with that is if you are more attached to your students or clients' outcome than they are, that sets up a toxic relationship as well because it's yes. you trying to manipulate them into whatever growth piece that you're trying to work with them on because you need them to go there before your validation of you as a coach or teacher and not because that's where they're ready to go. Right. So that's that's and that's actually another piece of the pie of the the, you know, if you can see something and, and you inoculate them against it, it's the exact same piece. Right. It's 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 the oh, look at me. I know I know what you need and you don't know it. And I'm going to make you see it so that you can see how valuable I am. Right. That's the same thing. And so, you know, that that becomes its own thing as well. So there's um, wow, there was another piece in there you were talking what was the last thing you just said? You just said, um, what was it that you just, what did you start that last piece with? Um, I was talking about projection and projection and yes. easeful releasing of, um, the power that's yes. projected onto you. Yeah. So, um, this was the other piece too, and it's related to the, um, the, you know, needing to get somebody there. Right. And it is the, um, I'm, I'm talking because it was in my head and I thought if I just keep talking, it'll come back. <laughs> Ooh, out, come out of the head, come out. Come hello, out. hello. No. Um, it, where is it? It was so good too. <laughs> was it about uh, well, projection? Was it about no, releasing? No. It, so it, okay. it was about well, stewarding the power. So, mm -hmm. um, but there's, there's a, there's so oh that's what it was thank you so when your when your students there so remember i said if you're intimidated by one of your students there's a problem right, right. sometimes your students are going to challenge you right and 
if you get defensive when they challenge you, then you're actually not helping because they're not actually challenging you. They're challenging your authority or they're, chal they're challenging you to try and get their power back or they're challenging you because they feel out of balance or because they feel unsafe. There's a reason why they're challenging you. And if you get defensive, you will never figure out what that reason is. And you will become tox toxic because you've made it about you when it never was. I think right? challenging is just like with little kids. Right. Mm -hmm. Some of the challenging is, is it safe right. to do this here and now? And yeah. if you hold it as a spiritual teacher, spiritual coach, if you hold that container safely and let them challenge and respond, not in a escalating kind of way, but meeting them at a different level of that energy, then they can like take a deep breath and relax and actually go deeper into the work because they understand it's safe to go deeper into the world. Right. Yes. But if you escalate and, and, you know, do that fight against them, now it's not safe. Yeah. And now not only is it not safe for them, but it's now unsafe for everybody who witnessed the experience. Yep. So you need to know that that's a, a situation. I've been in a workshop before where the person said that they were going to take care of someone in the workshop space who was in a vulnerable space and then proceeded to do six or eight different things that, that were really not taking care of the person. And they, they left them alone in the middle of the room. They wandered off. They, they didn't treat them with respect. There was, there was so many things that were just horribly done. And it, it's, it, she didn't mean to do it badly. She intended to follow what she said, but she was unconscious about how her actions were impacting the person in, in the middle of the room who was the, the sample person, right, who was the, the example. And so, you know, I was on the side of the room feeling horrible for the person in the middle of the room, and I know that everybody else in the room was feeling the same way. Because they were all putting themselves in that position, going, "Oh my God, I would ah, I, I feel unsafe. I would feel unsafe if, if I was there. I would feel terrible. I would feel unsafe. I would feel overexposed. I would feel unseen. I would feel not cared for." Ah, everyone in the room freaked out, and the person was blissfully unaware. <laughs> she was just completely clueless that that had happened. So remember, this is remember another piece. the one where. There, we had a, an attendee at one of our events like go off on me because of an expectation. Yes. And then, um, and what happened there was I held space for that person to, to clear what they needed to clear, but because it looked like an attack to everybody else. I had to step up exactly. and make sure that the person was safe from the group attacking them to defend Kathy. Yep. And so, you know, these are the dynamics that happen as I was like, Oh, the people in the group are getting very uncomfortable because for one, they don't deal well with anger. And for two, they don't, they, they're like, this is unfair and what's going on. And uh, I was to took everybody totally by, totally by surprise. So I, I paused once, once that person had gotten their anger out, I paused the group and the interaction with Kathy and said, okay, I need to check in with the group for a minute. And I asked the person's permission who was venting. I was like, are you, are you okay to take a breath for a minute? Because the group needs attention. And they, to their credit, they were like, yeah, okay. And they paused and I got a chance to talk to the group and explain that this was okay. And that this is, this is necessary. And did anybody need support? And were there people willing to be supportive if somebody was being like, if they couldn't be with anger, well, was there somebody willing to hug them and hold them and, you know, providing a space that kept everyone safe. But as much as it looked to the group, like I was keeping the group safe, which I was, but I was also concerned to keep the person who was venting safe because if the group did not feel safe, they would eventually turn on the person who was making them feel unsafe. Yep. And so uh, that was in service to both. And honestly, it was not in service to Kathy at all. 
Okay. I was, I was not concerned about Kathy. Kathy was able to take care of herself and I knew she wasn't taking it personally. So I was not defending Kathy in any way. I was simply trying to, to manage the dynamics of the group environment that we were in to make sure everybody was staying safe. Now, ironically, I'm sorry, I trusted you to do that because I had everything I could do to hold space for him. Not because, you know, not because I needed, I was feeling called to fight him back, but because there was so much of what he was going through that my attention had to be on him and keeping him in the immediacy of his process safe to continue. Because he really needed to let that go. Yes, he did. And ironically, um, I actually had the answer to the thing that he was upset about, but he went at Kathy about it. And so that, that actually worked out to our benefit because she was holding the space for him and I could come in and say, tell me what's going on. And he told me what's going on. I was like, Oh, remember in that last exercise where I said I couldn't give it to you yet. There was a piece of information spirit gave me and I wasn't allowed to hand it to you yet. Yeah. Well, okay. It's uh, this is it. (laughs) This is, Mm -hmm. This is what it was, and this is what the information was, and this is when you needed to hear it right now. And and it just dissipated everything that was going on for him. He just like, woof, right? So sometimes that's the case, and you have to trust that, right? So you have to be willing to trust spirit on it when the messages come through, even if it means that somebody gets angry and starts yelling, right? And... You know, if you can't hold someone else's anger, that's another indicator, indication that you need to do some more work because anger is a necessary part of any spiritual growth process. It, it just happens. I mean, you're going to have to deal with anger at some point in time because I don't know a single person who came into the spiritual world without a whole buttload of anger to deal with. The, the well of rage is real. And that's just the nature of the beast. So uh, you you have to be prepared to not only experience your own anger and, and know how to process that in your own experience, but you also have to be able to hold other people's anger without freaking out and shutting yep. down. So, you know, these are the things that we have to, to deal with on a regular basis. And so, um, okay, anything else you want to add to the mix? The... I, I made, you made a point earlier, and I want to emphasize it, is that you always have to meet them where they are. Yeah. You were talking about not trying to over, you know, in other words, if their energy was low, you were going to bring a bigger energy and lead them to the truth. But the thing is, is that if their energy is low, you have to meet them at low. Yeah. Okay. Because otherwise they're going to feel overpowered. Yeah. Um, and the, and and if their energy is low, that's all they're capable of in that moment. Yeah. And as the, the teacher, the coach, the person in that position, it's, it's our responsibility to be flexible for the needs of the people that we're dealing with. Um, and to read those clearly, this is about serving them, not serving us. And I think where power dynamics get abusive is when we make it about us. Right. Um, there's a, a lovely model in constellation work where when you step into the field as the facilitator and you're supposed to be doing something, right? Um, facilitating. And there's no energy in the field whatsoever. New constellators will often think, I'm doing something wrong. Okay? I'm doing something wrong. And you will find experienced constellators are in the field going, hmm, there's no energy for this. I'm right. not doing any, you know, there's, there, there's nothing here to facilitate. There's no energy for this. And then they'll go back and sit with the client and talk about, okay, why is there no energy for this? Or, you know, there's a bunch of things you can explore at that point, but they don't make it about them being wrong. They assess the situation and the energy of what's going on in the situation and respond to that. Yeah. And I think that's, that's just critically important to all of this. Absolutely. You know, I'll give another example when uh, of meeting somebody where they are. I remember being in a ritual and everybody was told to keep moving around the fire and there was this lovely drum and it was moving around the fire and everybody was moving around the fire and somebody stopped, knelt down next to the fire and just sat and went thump, thump on the ground. 
thump, thump with the, with the beat of the drum, thump, 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 thump. And that's all they were doing was thump, thump. And they had stopped and the facilitators wanted them to move. And I stopped to be with the person to get them to move. And the facilitator come up, came up to me and said, don't do that. Don't, I was like, leave me alone. I'm going to get them to move, <laughs> but leave me alone because I can't go from moving to where they were in a trance state in front of the fire. If I had grabbed them, that would have been so jarring. It would have pulled them completely out of their experience. It would have been so damaging to their psyche because they had been yanked out of a transformational, you know, trance state. Yep. And so I instead sat down, I kneeled down on the ground next to them and thumped with them and thump, thump until they noticed I was there. And I waited for them to notice I was there. I trained my energy with theirs. I combined my energy with theirs so that they would then notice I was there. And when they noticed I was there, I could issue the invitation with my hands silently for them to get up and dance with me and move around the fire, right? But I did it in a way that was completely non-jarring uh, to them. I came into where they were and then invited them back into the space that was being occupied by everyone else so that they could continue to take place in the ritual. This is, again, one of those things where if you come in like a bull in a china shop, like the facilitator came to me, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you end up with, that's an ego thing. It's yeah. like, you know, I was just being with where the person was. I knew what the facilitator wanted. I was on ritual team, right? I knew what they wanted, but I, I couldn't just yank them off the ground, right? And I knew that they shouldn't sit there because we were, we were in a process. And so I was doing what I knew to do to be able to facilitate that shift. And that meant going to where they are, right? And so this is one of those things that you have to pay attention to, whether it is in a coaching or teaching environment or whether it's in a ritual space, anything that you're dealing with, these are going to be relevant factors. You know, this work is highly complex. Yes. There's so many pieces and parts to it. And there's stuff that after, you know, 50 years of doing uh, study and 30 years of facilitation, you know, you, you just know, you intuitively know, right? And you just step into it and you're like, yeah, yeah, this is what needs to happen. And you're just following where the flow takes you. Now, if you're lucky, I, I had a conversation with somebody earlier today who is, you know, she's on the express train, right? <laughs> she's, she's working with teachers and the teachers are like, oh my God, you just did in a year what it usually takes people five years to do. It's like, yes, yeah, she's accessing her past life memories and they're coming forward and she just knows the answer, right? And so when you just know the answer, that makes sense. But not everybody just knows the answer. And so that's why it's important to get education on the subject and to be able to understand the why behind what you're seeing and to be able to go places and go, why does this make me feel good? And that makes me feel icky, right? If you, if you know the why behind those things, then you understand. And now you can be more conscious of how you behave when you're the facilitator, right? You know, part of this, I think, is the... Um We've talked about this before, but it's energetics. Mm -hmm. Power dynamics are in part about energetics. And there's so many examples of spiritual teachers, spiritual leaders, you know, uh, people who take people out on guided journeys. Um, they're not paying attention to the energy. They have a program in their head. They have a, yeah. a, a script in their head. They have a just like the person at the um, circle. There's a there's a methodology here that's supposed to be played out. Right, and so they're a, they're a they're attached to their method, they're yeah. attached to their script, and they aren't attuned to the energy of sometimes even the script itself. I've been on guided journeys. I know you have too, where they take mm -hmm. ten minutes to take you into state, and then they take you through the journey, and they get to the end of the journey, and they go, "Okay, I'm counting down to ten, and then you're back." And it's right. like, wait a minute, it took me 10 minutes to get here. You've got to give me more time to get out. You right. know, it's out of balance. But that um, sometimes the methodologies are out of balance energetically, and sometimes the methodology and the group 
are not in sync. And yeah. when you're attached to the methodology as the leader, you d do a disservice to the group and to the people in it. Yeah, and I want to say that, that these are not necessarily things that you never do once you figure out how to do them right, right? Mm -hmm. Because I know a community that had been around for 30 years at the time that they ran this particular ritual, who the ritual itself was about letting go of your expectations. And they had the ending part of the ritual was not at all being received in the way that they expected. The, the people were coming in jubilant instead of, you know, pensive and they wanted to celebrate and the end was, you know, suffer, suffer, coco bop. And, you know, you got to do this deep, hard chant and ask for help and blah, blah, blah. And this complicated dance thing, blah, blah, blah. And nobody was participating. Nobody. And they just didn't get it. They just did not grasp that they needed to let go of their own expectations, mm -hmm. which, by the way, if you're going to run a ritual on letting go of expectations, I promise you, you're going to have to let go of your expectations at some point along yep. the way. So that that one was a, you know, hello, McFly moment, because they they really should have known that. But, you know, we all screw up sometimes. We're human. And I know they knew that. I know yep. they knew that. But in that moment, they did not know that, right? It's just, they, they needed to have the whole thing fail before they could be, you know, before they could wake up and go, okay, maybe we need to change our expectations because the ending sec section just fell and it fell flat, hard. The whole energy just went, poof, poof, and it had to be started over. So, you know, I mean, it's not that, that um, you learn it and you never screw it up again because, you know, we're human and that's just the nature of the beast. And this was a whole group of people who had done this planning, you, you know. <laughs> it, was, it was a group, group uh, delusion that they were not going to have to change their own expectations. But we've all done it. Right. Yep. I mean, we've all screwed. I mean, you and I have told the story about, you know, walking away without closing our container and going, <laughs> why do I feel like I'm being dragged backwards? I was like, well, dumb, I fly. <laughs> why am I so tired? Why am I so tired? Yes. It's just like, I don't know. Well, maybe it's because all of your energy is still in the room. Yeah. Go figure. So, yeah, all of these things. It, it, it's just. So the other piece of the thing is, here is don't be a perfectionist. Right. Oh, yeah. If you are still being perfectionistic about what you're doing, you you need more work because, you know, you just have to surrender to the fact that you are going to screw things up sometimes. That's just we all screw things up sometimes. And you you need to know that you're allowed to be human and you need to know that if you take responsibility for what you screw up and you do your best to fix it, any reasonable person will be OK with that. You know, as long as your screw up isn't, you know, catastrophic, like super trauma damaging. Um, but, you know, and even then, if you screwed up it that way, in that way, okay, you screwed up in that way. You're like, yep, I screwed it up. Okay. So, you know, all I can do is forgive myself and move on, you know, make whatever amends I can to the other person if, if that is healthy for them, right? And just move forward and, and make an effort to never do that again, right? Yeah, but if you defend, if you pretend, if you gaslight, if you, you know, if you won't take responsibility, all of these things are things that say, yeah, I need more work. Well, and and it, it, it comes back to people. It, it becomes very hard when you feel wrong on the inside to yeah. be able to say to somebody, I was wrong. Yeah. Okay. Um, because you don't want to have to admit it. And the point is, is that sometimes you're wrong. And sometimes that's what needs to be said. Yeah. Well, and, you know, sometimes your students are giving you an indicator of where you need growth, right? Yep. I can't tell you how many times I've had a student say, well, you know, a wise woman once told me, <laughs> and then they and repeat you. me back to me about me. <laughs> like, rah! <You> know? <laughs> Quote myself to me, doggone it. 
Ah! Yep. <laughs> what was that podcast you were going to do? Taking my own advice. Taking yeah. Taking my own advice. Yes, I was. I was going to do a interview somebody, give them advice, and then I was going to have a mirror moment. Mirror yeah. moment. Very important. Turn it around and go. Okay, now this came out of my mouth. People show up in front of me so that I can learn things from mm -hmm. them as well as my own. So in this mirror moment, what is it that I just said that I need to pay attention to? <laughs> right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, these are these are things that we we do need to hear sometimes. And then of course, you know, I remember your wonderful trip to Cornwall and and the shadow cows and the chickens of light. <laughs> Because her shaman said everything is relevant, and everything so they went is relevant. Yes. okay. And they saw these signs on the side of the road that were, you know, cow crossings of shadow cows and chickens. How were the chickens of light? Well, that wasn't a sign. They were just relation to that, right? Yeah, the chickens of light were. Um, that wasn't a sign, but the chickens of light we decided were the. The, you know, there's balance in the universe between light and dark. And okay. so the shadow cows could not exist without balance. And therefore, the chickens of light were the balance, just like there were domesticated scones and the wild and fruity scones that roamed the moors. Right. So needless to say that they were being a bit flippant in their, their pursuit. But it was to balance the leader's seriousness, right? He was being highly serious. And so they were balancing that. And so, you know, if you're the teacher in that regard, if you're the leader of that and the people are being flippant, well, maybe you ought to look at how serious you're being, right? It's not about scolding people and having them be more serious. It's literally about, well, how am I going over the top? Because they're going over the top in the other direction to balance me, right? right. These, again, this is the, you know, taking it personally, right? It's never personal, okay? It, it may be a response to something you're doing, but it doesn't mean that they hate you. They wouldn't have paid to work with you if they hate you, right? They wouldn't have paid to work with you if they think you suck. So, you know, you got to stop thinking like that. It's, Ooh. that's not about them. That's about your inner not good enough showing up, right? Remember yeah. the, um, the t-shirts we got? The, I sat with somebody in a ritual and they said they had been seriously seeking the answer to their problem. And I knew what it was. And I sat next to them and they said, I, I, I have to know, I have to know, I have to know. And I said, do you seriously mean that? And they're like, yes. And I said, you know, because I can, I can help you here. I've got this answer, but you have to really, really want it. And she was like, yes, I really, really want it. And I checked the energy and she did. So I gave her the answer. She burst into tears because it was the, it was the linchpin, right, to make right. the transmission. And then I sat there for a couple of minutes and I, you know, stepped in and, and basically said, you know, I love you. And remember the line? Oh, I'll yeah. I love she... you later. <laughs> <laughs> I will love you later. Also known as I fucking hate you right now. <laughs> So, but, but I know I asked for it, so I'll love you later. But right now, I hate you, yes. right? You know. And so we made T-shirts often... out of that. I just found it the other day. <laughs> I love you later T-shirt. <laughs> yeah, I'll love you later. Yeah, and you know, I've had people go Aah! with me, and I'm like, yes, and the horse I rode in on, and they're like, yes. <laughs> Yep. It's okay. Yeah, you can tell me to go fuck myself. I'm okay with that. I understand why. And, and it's okay. I'm not taking it personally. Right? It's like, let it out, baby. Let it out. I'm here to hold it for you. You know, that's, that's, that's the way it goes. So, yeah. So these are the things that as teachers, we have to pay attention to. And this is one of the reasons why it is so crucial to do your personal work when you are going to be facilitating for others. This is, if you don't, this is known as a wounded healer. And there's an entire archetype around this because it happens so often where people go, oh, I don't want to do my own work. I want to help others. Like you cannot help other people if you are not doing your own work. Because inevitably, someone in the process of you trying to help them will trigger you or will get you in a position where you feel like you need to prove your value and then you're going to manipulate. And then, you know, that's just an unhealthy dynamic, right? They, we do our work so that we can be safe space for others. We do our work for ourselves too. In fact, you have to do your work for yourself first. 
before you can be safe space for others. Because if you're not doing it for you, you will not get through it. Guaranteed. Yep. You cannot do it for other reasons. You have to do it for you. You have to be like, yep, I need to do this. I need to do this for me. I have a, you can use the mission that you're on. I mean, we talk about the hundred thousand and, and whether, you know, if, if you woke up in your, in your spiritual awakening and went, oh my God, I have this huge mission and I don't know what it is and I don't know how to do it. And I know that I'm way behind and I'm late to the party and I got to do it yesterday. Well, okay. You can use that mission, that drive to help you to do your work, but it can't be about them. It can, it has to be about you fulfilling your mission because it's yours and you being able to do your work, but you still got to do it for you. Right? So, you know, this is the other thing that we get into toxicity sometimes is partners who bring their partners to events. And the partner is just like, eh. you know, the one who came because they the other person wanted them to is not there for themselves. They're there for their partner. And they will gum up the works. They will gum it up for themselves. They will gum it up for others because they don't really want to be there. Right. They just came to placate their partner. Or they came to try and be a good partner, but not because they actually wanted to be there, right? These are things that happen, right? So when you are looking at these things, you've got to understand the dynamics. You know, this is the, I was talking to Jeff, my husband, uh, the other day, and I was asking him about, you know, because we did training for ritualists a few years back, and he took the training. And a lot of it wasn't, you know, um, written lessons like a lot of our other programs are where there are a lot of written lessons. This was just us facilitating. And I couldn't remember exactly what we had done. And so he was talking to me about it. And, and we were talking about the fact that the, the work around the ritual stuff, a lot of it was just about understanding the dynamics and about understanding how to speak spirit because spirit will walk you through whatever you need to be walked through as the facilitator, as the ritualist, if you will just give over to it. If you will allow it to happen, spirit will tell you what comes next, right? In fact, most of the, many of the rituals that Kathy and I have put together have an insert miracle here portion where we're like, well, and something will happen here and it'll be fine, right? We just, there's the, it doesn't come into form when we're designing it, but in the moment it goes thunk and that's what it is. And it's not even the same thing for everybody every time. It may be something that's custom to each person who walks through that space, or it could be the same thing for everybody. We just don't know. And being able to walk into that space without knowing is saying, I trust spirit. Yeah. It's not, I trust myself. It's not anything. It's I trust that I'm going to stand in this moment and I will know the answer because spirit will hand it to me. The energy will say what needs to happen here. And I will just do what I'm told. Right. I, the first ritual I was ever in, um, they made me goddess of the underworld and people were coming down to plant seeds. The first ritual ever. If people were coming down to plant seeds and plant their intentions, right? On the upper circle, they had let go of stuff and they were planting the seed for what they wanted to grow in the new year. And I was supposed to give each of them a message. And I, there was, this is the insert miracle here, right? There was no standard message. It was the message that needed to come through me to the person. Right. So having never first ritual, ritual ever, imagine. Okay. Yeah, first ritual ever. So I had like two glasses of wine because I figured if I didn't <laughs> shut down my, you know, spinny brain that yeah, I wouldn't get out of the way. But the bifurcated consciousness that exists when you're doing a ritual and you're in that space of getting out of the way and your yeah. own self, which is keeping track of you so that you don't fall into the fire or do something bad. Um, I remember having this silly little conversation which is the, um, uh, the, the, the logical part was going, well, how do you know what to say? And the part that was channeling stuff, you know, coming through says, shut up, it's working. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know? Because Worry about it, was, it later. <laughs> well, and I have no idea what I said to people. No. Okay? Yeah, you and don't. It was not, not in the those same spaces. Nope. No. No. Mm-mm. Nope, yeah, it was you don't remember time. a lot because you're you're not you're not even fully there. So, Correct. yeah, 
it, it's it's very interesting. But we but that's are the same we're... thing that happens with spiritual coaching. Is yes. that you may remember, okay, because it's a slight, sure. it's not in ritual space, but the point is get out of your own way. Yeah. So that you can and, be and... there for the people that you have entered into a relationship with to yeah. help them achieve what it is they're trying to achieve. And stop making it all about you because it is right. never yeah. about you. Right. That's right. Okay. So on that, that that's going to be my Kellyism for the day. Stop making it all about you. It's never about you. That's the Kellyism for the day. And so with that, uh, we're going to wrap up this ex ep episode. Yes, I could talk. <laughs> so, uh, I want to, uh, tell you guys that, uh, the registration for the retreat is open. Now I am recording this, uh, four days after we opened registration for uh, the students only. And I've already got f six people registered for a 20 person retreat. Now this is coming out in two weeks. So we may have even more people registered. So if you have an interest in the adventures in energetics retreat that we have been talking about uh, uh, over the course of the last few podcasts, then this is the time to go and register. It is a seven day, six night retreat. You can find the retreat information at kellysparta.com forward slash retreat and uh, go in and you do have to apply because I want to make sure that you are going to be safe in the environment, that you have the skills to make it through the environment because it is not for beginners. Uh, and so you will have to apply and t answer some questions for me so that I understand where you are in your process and, and what you know how to do and not do. Uh, I may give you an assignment if you're close. I may give you something that you have to learn between here and there. Uh, but you have several months to, to do that. So there's plenty of time to do that. Um, and I will send over the materials if, if I deem that that's necessary. So, uh, but come out and join the retreat because it's going to be so awesome. I'm so excited. Ah, it's in Boquete, Panama. It's in my hometown. You get to come and see me in person. It's the first time in four years that we're running a retreat. So I am so excited and it's, it's going to rock and roll. It's going to be so good. So, all right, that's it for this week. Uh, Tune in next time as I add another chapter into your guide to energy, magic, and the spirit world. I'm Kelly Sparta here with Kathy Shiren, and you have been listening to Spirit Sherpa. So long, everyone. Bye-bye.